right. Good morning, Los Altos. I uh, hope you all had a very restful three-day weekend. Uh, today, we are going to be talking about the SMAP reports and also showcasing this uh, online tool called Pear Deck. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and have you sign on. And here is what you're going to be doing. You are going to go to joinpd.com, just like that, joinpd.com. And then you're going to enter this code right here. And uh, you can or you don't have to put in a space, but uh, go ahead and put in that code. And I'm just going to walk you through the, uh, both what a teacher sees and what a student sees. So first couple of things um, here, I'm going to see how many students are connected. So if I had a class of 30, I could see, all right, how many are still logging on. I could also provide a link for the students. I could put that on my Canvas page. Um, and then here you can also see the uh, teacher dashboard, and I'll show you what that looks like. Basically, this is the teacher dashboard, and I'm going to be able to see what students are uh, presenting or writing. The code is always here at the top corner. And so if a student walks in late or hasn't gotten the code, you can always remind them that the code is there on the side here. Okay, let's go ahead. It looks like most of you are on, and it is at student paste. So that means you can go ahead and move ahead. And this is one of the ways I do differentiated instruction for some of my students who need more time or some students who are ready to go. Okay, so we're going to start with a little just... Uh, SEL, if you will, just a little uh, brain break before we head into the main part of our topics today. And so I always like to use this slide a little bit like Pictionary. So if you're willing to draw something, I know it's kind of hard with the mouse pad, uh, with the, just the touch screen. But uh, let's see, what are things that bring you joy and happiness, right? So if you can go ahead and draw, and I want to show you here some of the tools that you can use for drawing. You can make the pencil lighter or thinner, right? You, uh, you have a pencil here highlighting, so you can go ahead and do that. Um, and I'll give you just a few minutes to kind of play with that. You can also type in the words. Notice how you can click on the text. And then if I wanted to, I can show the student responses. And here they are, right? Notice that they are anonymous, so thank you. And then I can hide them. Okay, um, let's keep going. So let's go over uh so let's take a little poll here just i want to know where you are at in your uh familiarity with pear deck okay give you a moment to do that all right and let's go ahead and show the responses very good this is kind of where most teachers are at okay um here's our learning target as you all know i am have been a high school english teacher for many years 25 years in fact and i just left the classroom last year and one of my main goals is to just go around and support teachers, especially using some tools that might really help them in engaging our students. So I think this is important as you are getting now, maybe your SMAP reports and you want to see, okay, how can I use data to drive my instruction? And, you know, one of the things I'm going to talk about is how do you make sure that your students are engaged in the material that you're giving them? And so I'm going to use this tool to show you how, you know, something like looking at statistics and data can be made more engaging uh, by using a program like this. So this is what we'll do. Okay, and let's start with some research. So I know it's a little bit dated here, but uh, I think we would all agree that with this title of this article, I'm just gonna read the little part here. Think about how difficult it must be to read even five pages of an 800 page college book when we've been used to uh, spending most of our time switching between one digital activity and another in matter of seconds. This really highlights the challenges that many students are facing in our current era. So many of our students are distracted. They have this, you know, little computer on their, you know, their hands all of their time. And it's hard for them to do something like, like what we would like them to do, which is maybe read a long passage or listen to a lecture. Uh, so, Let's take a look here. So with this slide, what I'd like you to do is you're going to take your highlighting pen here, or you can use your pencil. You're going to read, and then as you're reading, you're going to highlight anything that you think was interesting, interesting words or phrases, sentence. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit about immersive reader. So go ahead and take a time to do that. All right, so, you know, one of the things that I like to highlight here is this dot part down here. Abundant research suggests that isolated skill instruction um, they receive may perpetuate perpetuate a long literacy, low literacy achievement rather than improve. So 
you know, for many years, we've been used to like going back to the basics. Oh my no, oh no, my students don't know how to use, um, you know, periods and commas. They're still doing fragment sentences. So I'm going to take out those worksheets and we're just going to, you know, drill and kill them. And yes, there are times for that, but overall, I do not want to look at the data and say, oh no, my students have this huge gap. I'm going to take them all the way back to second grade skills and not have them learning, uh, you know, at level grade skills. Uh, because what's happening is that uh, if we stay in this zone for too long of a time, we're just creating a larger gap and our students need to be moving forward, right? So how do we do that? I'm going to give you some tools and strategies that you can use to, sh again, teach at that rigorous level, right? Um, at the same time, build up their skills. Now, let's take a moment to explore one tool that you can use, and that is Immersive Reader. So go ahead and click on Immersive Reader. And what you will find is something like this. So now the article um, can be read to me. So yes, we live in an era where, you know, maybe many of us don't have time to read. So we'll put on a podcast and we're listening. So listening skills are important. And plus it helps the students move their eyes faster through the text. I'll go ahead and click on the little book here. And so this is great for your English learners. Now, you know, I always have, you know, some teachers always kind of feel a little odd about, you know, should they be reading things in their own language? And I'm going to say yes. If you have students who are very, you know, beginner, they're still maybe, you know, struggling with some vocabulary and so forth, you might want to have them read it in their native language. Now, of course, this has to do with their literacy skills in that language too, but they can listen to it and hear that, right? And, and so we're trying to make them, remember, we're trying to make them multilingual, not monolingual. So yeah, they can listen to it in their own language, keep building, and I would celebrate. Hey, if you're bilingual, read it in both languages, right? You don't want to lose that second language. Uh, notice how you can also, uh, let's say I want to teach some grammar part out of here. Um, and so yes, take a look at this. I can talk about syllables. I can talk about, um, you know, maybe I just want them to look at adjectives here because we're doing a word bank on adjectives, okay? And then, of course, they can adjust for their own. So really great, great, awesome tool. All right, we're going to click out of that. Go ahead and click here. All right, I love this graphic, and I think it's so important that I emphasize it at every workshop that I do uh, because I really want it to kind of like sink into our pores, right? Our Generation Z, our students who are tweens and teens, are different from maybe how we, uh, we were. And we're not trying to make them clones of us. We cannot take them back. So we're not taking them to the past. We're taking, pushing them towards the future. And we need to understand, and I'm not going to read all of them, but please definitely take some time to read this. Our students are social. They like to interact. Now, of course, you know, there's some that don't. But for the majority, this is a social group. Uh, here's a big one. They're multitaskers. Uh, these kids can be on five screens at once. They're constantly going back and forth. Um, in fact, you know, when I sit down to watch a movie in my living room, I am sitting, watching the movie. That's it. There's nothing else, right? Maybe I have my cell phone on the side, but I'm really, you know, I have notifications off. However, on our younger generations, they don't really watch movies. Why? Their attention span might not be there. Plus, that movie watching um, experience is different for them. They might be watching slightly the television, but they also have a cell phone on the side and maybe they have a laptop also open at the same time. I mean, they are constantly moving. Could be a good thing, could be a bad thing, but it is what it is. So how can we use that skill in our teaching to leverage their learning? They're entrepreneurs. They want to know how to sell things, right? Whether marketing online, using YouTube, becoming bloggers, right? Uh, there you have their TikTok, right? They're selling themselves. So how can we use that? You know, they're going to want those skills. So what can we do in the classrooms to, to provide space for that? They're educated. Whether we like it or not, they might not want to be learning what we're doing. They might find our uh, topics uh, boring, but they will spend hours going a rabbit hole on something they are passionate about. So there is gold. It's a gold mine right there. Find out what they're interested in, and you will see those kids come alive. They're philanthropists. Again, that's part of what, you know, they're educated. They're educating themselves about social justice issues. They are, um, they, they won't even spend money or shop at certain places because they're aware that it doesn't follow their values. 
digital natives, they're interactive, tech savvy. Yes, we know they are less focused. We understand that. And because of that, we need to be careful that we're not lecturing for a long periods of time and that we're not giving the, the, these long passages or readings without giving those breaks. Because again, their brain has been, you know, they've grown up with this. And yes, as much as we won't want to, you know, blame our teenagers, uh, you might want to ask, well, who gave them the cell phone in the first place, right? And so, uh, you know, I'm a parent, my kids have cell phones. Um, we are providing this. So it's like taking kids to a candy store, putting them in there and putting one little bowl of broccoli and wondering why they're not eating the broccoli, right? So as a society, we've created this. So let's not blame so much, you know, the teenager. They are cautious. And one of the things we notice is, is and I'm hearing this across the district is that kids don't seem to be taking that risk. They're waiting the teacher out. They don't raise their hand. They're not maybe, um, you know, taking a risk in, in answer, making the wrong uh, answer. Uh, same thing with even going to college. Think about it. They've grown up in a chaotic world where the future is, is you know, it's not secure. So when we talk about this will be good for college, they don't even know what the future holds right? Things have been disrupted. They've seen family members die. They've seen people lose their jobs who had degrees. And so let's be aware that that future, they're, they're skeptical about it. So if we give them things that maybe they find valuable right now, it might lead them to that conversation. So we might need to start changing a little bit of that conversation about college, college, college. All right. Well, now let's talk about the SMAP, the Student Measures of Academic Progress, as you will. So NWEA is the basically the organization and MAP is the assessment that we're looking at, right? So what is a RIT score? So let's go ahead and take a moment and you can just highlight if you want. And so the key part here that I want to show you is that MAP growth is measuring how students are growing. It's tracking their progress, right, throughout the school year. And it's providing you uh, the ability to understand their performance as how it compares to their peers. So you're going to see comparisons to their district peers and also to this national norm. And so this RIT scale here, as you'll see, is going to get to give you a score. However, you know, this test is uh, created. It is adaptive and uh, students, you know, will be scoring at the 50 percentile in that area. Right. So if a student is, let's say, a ninth grader, but maybe their reading level is at seventh grade. The more questions they get correct, the harder that test will go. If not, it'll keep on that, basically that seventh grade range. And most of the time, they'll get about 50% of those questions um, incorrect. So we want to tell our students that they shouldn't take, you know, all this long time to t answer one question. They should be, again, uh, prioritized. All right. If this is a question I don't really know, I'm looking at the question first. I'm not too sure how to answer it. I'm going to try my best and move on. Um, you know, some kids were taking, you know, I think I saw up to 184 minutes taking a test. Uh, and no, you know, you do want to tell them you're not going too slow, but you're not going too fast. Uh, tell them, you know, if they were taking the driver's ed test, they, they, those would be timed too. So NWA does uh, have a normative data. data. And you'll see that, and it is from 2020. Okay, let's watch this little video. And as you watch this video, then I'm going to have you write, you know, what's the key takeaway. So they explain a lot better than I. All right, what else do we have? Okay, let's take a look. So this is that normative data I was telling you about. So this is the 2020, right? And so here that we'll, you know, look at a few things. So let's say I have a ninth grader. This is what, you know, most students in the nation in 2020 scored at in the fall. So this is why we have a testing window, because technically students should be taking this test in within the first four weeks of school. So this is where we're at. So what is it that the district is interested in? They're interested in, yep, in growth. Let's see if I can write this out, right? So this is not, you know, we're not looking for all students to be at, you know, 95 percentile. We're looking at their growth between the fall, the winter, and spring. So this student is going to move up slightly. And you'll notice that in the younger ages, they're moving up a lot more. Take a look at 155 here, and then look how much they've grown here, right? But as you get older, that learning slows down, right? Um, maybe you're reviewing a lot more and so forth. Now, I might have a ninth grader, like I said, who's actually reading maybe at a 
fifth grade level. Doesn't mean I'm giving that student fifth grade books, right? It just means I need to scaffold a lot more, differentiate a lot more. Now, here's another interesting number, and that is the standard uh, deviation. And basically, that means how diverse my uh, learners are in that group, meaning this is the spread, right? So that's going to be important when you get to your own reports. And this is, of course, the language one. All right, what else do we have? Um, let's go ahead and move on to oops, uh, this data here. Okay, so now we're looking at your own school data. Here's, you know, the percentages. And so you can highlight here if you find anything interesting just to kind of keep you engaged. All right. So then we look at this and we should have lots of questions, okay? Like, what does this mean and so forth? So this is just under the category of reading and this is for the fall. Now remember that this was our first time giving this test. So there is a lot of kinks that we need to work out, including scheduling. Um, you know, for some teachers, it might've taken like four days to just give this test for just the language arts. I get that. That might be something that you and your administrators need to work out. I don't believe ELA teachers should be the only ones giving this test as all teachers are responsible for teaching literacy skills. So I think they need to be able to look over the shoulders and see the type of passages and they will find that many of the passages are actually nonfiction. And so uh, that's something that, again, school needs to decide. Um, yes, as you'll notice, our 12th graders scored a little bit lower, as you can see here. Then you know, they also did a little bit higher here. So it's an interesting sandwich here. Um, and really, you know, if we're saying that students should be at 70%, right? So 70% is what uh, the company NWEA is saying uh, will equal to that MET on CASP. So that's really kind of our large target. But as you can see, 70% would be somewhere here in the middle of the green. So this, you take this kind of cut it in half, and then this is the area of students who are at proficiency level or above. Okay, so think about your 12th graders. Again, remember, I have a senior who's sitting in class, and last time he had an uninterrupted school year was way back here in eighth grade. That was the last time he had a complete year, right? Because here, ninth grade, he was interrupted halfway through the year with the pandemic. Tenth grade was in distance learning. Eleventh grade was wonky. We had long-term subs, right? We had um, kids and teachers sick, and it was just an odd year. And so here we are now and trying to, you know, get them back to normal. And so a lot of kids are feeling apathetic. They haven't stretched out, let's say, right, their brain for a long time. Okay, here's a, another uh, interesting report that you might want to look at. Uh, a couple things I want to point you to is how many, you know, total number of your students. This is your uh, average, right? So I'm just taking a sample class here, average. And here is your standard deviation, right? How many points? So the bigger that number, the more differentiated uh, instruction I need to give. The whole group instruction is not going to work as effective because I have a lot of kids on the edge. This is the district, so you'll notice that this class did lower than the district average. And here is the um, the mean for the normative mean, right? So this is where most uh, students in the nation who took this test at seventh grade on week eight. So important things to look at, as you can see here, and then it breaks down under reading, literary, informative, and vocabulary. All right, here's another interesting, this is under class profile, in the moment you're going to be playing with your uh, your own reports. And you'll see here, okay, this is an English 3 class, right? And it says 73 students took the test. And it'll say here, you know, okay, um, it'll tell you a little report. Your 11th grade students have scored uh, below the national average. So there was the national average, right? And be careful with this median percentile because some teachers are getting like in the green and like, oh, yay. However, you know, pay attention to these kids down here and of course to these kids up here right? They need something different. And it doesn't mean different lesson. It just means I'm going to give them slightly different maybe tasks within that. Now, I, here's a cool little website that you might want to check out. It just gives you an idea of Lexile. And for a lot of juniors, one of the first texts they have to read is the U.S. Constitution and other uh, foundational works. Look at that Lexile. It is at 600, 1600 Lexile, right? So here's my class. And I'm going to show you this report that you also get right? So this is your class profile. This is the same class of juniors. Take a look at their Lexile. 
That's 185 to 335 lexile. How many students, if I were to give them the U.S. Constitution to read on their own independently, would be able to do that? You see it there? One student. One student. So you might be saying, so do I not give them the U.S. Constitution? No, not saying that. They should be exposed. But maybe we're doing a read-along in the class. Maybe I'm doing a think-through. Maybe I'm not giving them the whole passage. Maybe I'm putting them in groups so that they can help each other out. I'm mixing up my groups. So again, we need to make, this is how I'm using data to guide my instruction. I'm not teaching them all the same way. Here's another great report. It's going to be called Class Breakdown by our uh, RIT score. And, you know, I'm sorry, as you know, as we were working this out, we realized that, you know, maybe we should categorize students by period. But here you have all of your students from all of your classes. Um, and so, you know, one of the things that you're going to notice, let's say I'm teaching informational documents, the majority of my students are right here, right? Here's where I'm at, all right? So it means that I could be reviewing the skills, and it'll if you click on here, I'll tell you what those skills are. But really, I'm trying to move them over like one band, right? Only by one band here. I'm not going to try to like, oh, okay, all of a sudden they're going to be writing a 10-page research paper, right? So I need to know who they are. Now, here's the important part. I need to know who these outliers are. See that? I need to find out. I'm going to look at this and like, oh, yeah, that kid's been absent for like three weeks, right? Maybe it's the kid who then will end up over here in the next round. Uh, oh, yeah, that kid just sped through the test. They, the motivation is an issue. All right, maybe that's one that I want to talk to one-on-one, -on -one, show him where he stands, you know, with the rest of his peers. Sometimes a little bit of that pressure kicks in. I know my kid was so happy. He brought home, he's like, Mom, guess what? He brings home and tells me, you know, if he improved on a, on a test or not. So we, we're not giving our reports yet to the parents. We're waiting on that. But you can kind of see these are the RIT scores, the overall RIT scores. Maybe I'm, you know, again, putting these kids in, in certain groups, intentional groupings. Now, careful with these kids over here. Um, I do not, I am not a big proponent of having kids here constantly be tutors to the kids over here. I mean, I could give it as a class job, or right? But I need to give them some enrichment. Maybe they're writing, creating a newsletter for the class. Maybe they're researching something of interest to them, right? Maybe they're blogging. So I'm giving them a little something different while I'm working with these kids over here. All right, what else? Okay, let's go ahead and take a moment and well, that was a lot of information. Based on this data, we talked about reading. Um, why do you think students are not reading? What's going to be, you know, your personal opinion? Go ahead and take a moment, answer those questions. And I'm going to show you a little bit more of what the research says. I'm going to have you do that on your own. You can read that, uh, you know, at your own pace. And I'm just going to go over some activities. So I've been using Pear Deck. I'm going to give you, I'm going to, you're going to all be getting this slide also, uh, Google Slides. And if you click here, it's a little short tutorial I created. Uh, when you, if you do want to do Pear Deck, do not go to sign up for free. You're actually going to do teacher login and use your school credentials. You're going to use your Google account. You can do this on Google or you could do it on Microsoft too. All right. What else? Um, here it just shows you that you need to add this uh, as an extension. And once you have it, it'll always show up there when you click on extensions. And then your templates you can do, or you can create your own um, slides. You can make them interactive, just like I did here. All right. And I talked about study sync. You can actually take a passage. So here I would, you know, make sure you don't you unclick uh, annotations, copy, and then you paste it here. And so now I made my inter I made an interactive slide, right? And I can have them highlight, I can have them draw something, I can have them write a little short uh, summary, right? And the fun thing is that I can see what everyone is doing. So here I get to see everyone's, you know, uh, answers. All right. Okay, what else do we have? So that's, yep, this is what I would see from my students. And this is great because now I can hit the ELD standard because now I'm giving differentiated uh, and I'm addressing language needs possibly. I can also give them comments and so forth. Um, a couple other strategies you might be interested in. Uh, Study Sync does have uh, graphic novels that maybe some students might be interested in. Imagine taking here is, uh, the, I think it was Beowulf, if students actually wrote the little um, captions for each of these, right? That would be fun for them. 
I'm a big proponent of Kagan strategies where students are working together. Yes, they're going to fight you on it. Um, but it's like my kids fight me with eating vegetables, but you know, we all know it's good for them. So, you know, just love like, okay, I hear your complaints. Too bad. We're going to work on groups. And so, you know, here are different ways that students can work in groups. And finally, I leave you with this page. And this is just a choice board for you to explore on your own time. Lots of things, you know, you have nothing to do during Thanksgiving break and you just want to geek out <clears throat> on um, on different techniques. These are all hyperlinks on little tutorials on how to use things like Pear Deck, Flipgrid, Jamboard. And I'm always available to meet with you one on one to show you and walk you through how to set it up. I've even gone into classrooms and modeled a lesson like using Flipgrid so that the teacher can just kind of sit back and watch how uh, I might introduce the topic and have them go through all those, you know, tech issues. All right. <clears throat> so as I would do with my own class, it is time for you to choose. Uh, I'm going to give you a couple of choices. You can either now go into your reports and check on, you know, and I'm going to show you a link here how to get up to those reports, or you can set up Pear Deck and I'll just be walking around to help you do that. Uh, and so, you know, to get into the reports, here's the link for you to go ahead and you can follow and, and, you know, I'll let you kind of explore there. Okay. All right. Thank you. And a couple of the things I'll be sending you, you know, a uh, Google form, please give me some feedback. It always helps me and, uh, you know, improve in my skills. Here's some other resources. Uh, there is an ELA page where I have been uploading lesson plans and these kind of tools. I'm also working on a monthly newsletter. And finally, we have our ELA virtual PDs happening every third Tuesday. Our next one won't be till January. So I thank you very much. And I'll be walking around and helping you one-on-one. -on -one. Thank you.